Well, I encourage you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. We're going to be studying verses 45 to 49 this morning. And as we take verses 45 and 49 this morning, along with the verses that we, we looked at and we studied last Lord's Day, it gives us the picture of the crucified and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ our Lord. This morning in verses 45 to 46, I'm going to break it down here a little bit, and then we'll go back over it. But in verses 45 to 46, you see Jesus in this great cry of distress, this great cry of abandonment. It can even be classified, and if you look at your outline this morning and the title of the message, it's this, this cry of rejection. Then in verse 46, we see the role of God the Father in this punishment. And finally, in verses 47 to 49, we see the response of those who were present or really a rather, I'd rather say it, an improper response or inappropriate response to what Jesus was undergoing. Number one in your outline this morning is the suffering of Christ as a measure of his love. In verses 45 to 46, in these verses, Matthew is, listen to this, in, in, in the word of the language of that time, Matthew is ordering, he is commanding us to look at what Christ endured. That's the way it is. It, it sounds like when we read it, we just, okay, here's what he's going through. No, Matthew is saying, listen up. You look at this. I am commanding you to look at what Jesus endured and to consider it, you ready for this? A measure of his love for you. Matthew, focus, his focus has been on more than just the physical suffering that Jesus was going through. In these two verses, Matthew, the, the, the disciple, Matthew, the apostle, is going to highlight something totally apart from the greater than the physical suffering that Jesus has endured. Now, let, let's set the stage, so to speak. And I, I don't like to use that phrase, but, you know, it's, I can't think of a better one. Let's set the stage. We're in Israel. It's high noon. And Matthew tells us that here in the sixth hour, which would be like we would say 12 noon, that the sky was darkened. And not only there in the city, but the whole land was in a deep, and think of this, put yourself there in a deep, dramatic, intense, unforgettable darkness which continued to what in Jewish time would be the ninth hour or what we would say today to about 3 p.m. So from 12 noon to 3 p.m., you are in total darkness. And Matthew reminds us, of course, that Jesus Christ goes up and certainly it's a cry yielding up his spirit. It goes up at 3 p.m. You ready for this? Which, is, or which was the time of the evening sacrifice. So what is Matthew doing here? What's, it, what, what's he saying? Matthew is anchoring our understanding of the death of Christ to the Old Testament sacrificial system. Because Jesus was what? He was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. And Matthew is saying, you ready for this? Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all things that the Old Testament sacrificial system pointed to. But this isn't all. Because these events occurred between the hours of 12 noon and 3 p.m., Matthew is reminding us that in Old Testament darkness, in the words of the prophet, was one of the things that accompanied the final judgment of God. And there is no better passage which combines the idea 
of darkness with God's final judgment and the death of Christ in the New Testament than the prophet Amos over in chapter 8 and verse 9. Amos the prophet writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Darkness in the words of the prophet was to emphasize, you ready for this, terror. That it would be for wicked men to face the just judgment and wrath of God. So darkness is an image that all the prophets will and did use. Matthew reminds us of this darkness because Matthew knows, remember who he's writing to, Matthew knows that every good Jewish reader of this gospel of his will remember that the plague immediately prior to the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, the plague immediately prior to the, the killing of the firstborn of Egypt was the plague of darkness. Now turn with me, if you have your Bibles, Keep one finger in uh, Matthew, but turn over to Exodus. Exodus chapter 10. And when you find Exodus chapter 10, then find verse 21. The writer of Exodus says this in chapter 10 and verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which, uh, which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwelling. Matthew, the apostle, Matthew, the disciple, is matching up that plague of Egypt with the visitation, listen, of the wrath of God on his son. Now, you may be thinking, and hopefully you are thinking, well, now, wait a minute, pastor. There's a problem here. In the prophets, the darkness of terror of God was to be visited upon, and especially in Exodus, upon Egypt, which... It rejected the one true God. And it not only rejected the one true God, but it persecuted his people, the Israelites. And here on the cross, the, the terror accompanies the punishment and the judgment that God visits on his own son. Some of you may be thinking or, or wondering, Pastor, that doesn't make sense. And that's exactly the point. God is saying that here on the cross, his own son, his perfect son, the son of his love, ready, is the one who is alone going to face this terror. Here his son alone, in your place and mine, faces darkness of the, of the terror of the judgment of God. And beloved, it's in the midst of this darkness that Jesus lifts up his heart, cry, and rendering this cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now what does that cry mean? Yes, our Lord is quoting Psalm 22. Christ is quoting the very first verse of that psalm. And it's very important that you and I understand it. Remember, Jesus, okay, he is, he's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1, and it's important for us to understand that in that cry, this is a cry, Jesus is not being faithless. Psalm 22, if you read that psalm, Psalm 22 ends with God vindicating his servant, and his servant reigns over his enemy. Jesus' cry there is not a cry of faithlessness. 
In fact, I would think it as one of the greatest cries of faith in his entire earthly ministry. Jesus is trusting God despite all the evidence to the contrary, isn't he? That God will vindicate him. That's what Jesus is trusting in. That his Holy Father will vindicate him in the end and he will reign over his enemies. And bless God, he will one day. Now, nor is this a cry, a cry of surprise. Jesus doesn't get to the cross, and if I may, and I'm not doing this lightheartedly, but Jesus doesn't get to the cross and say, Oh, Lord, something's gone wrong. This wasn't supposed to happen. I am totally taken by surprise by this. I didn't know this was coming. Beloved, this is not what Jesus is saying when he cries out that words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is drawing our attention to several things, and I want us to see them this morning. The first one I want you to see is the isolation. His sense of isolation from the favor of the love of his heavenly Father which he is willingly, notice this, he, and, I, and I keep saying this, and I don't want you to get bothered by it, and I don't want you to go, oh, there he says it again. I wanted to dwell within you that Jesus willingly endured this on our behalf. The troubled scene of isolation really should touch every single human heart deeply. And as students of the Bible, you'll recall in John chapter 16 and verse 32 that Jesus says, Behold, an hour is coming and already has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. And the Lord told his disciples that, and yet he knew in a few hours there was going to be a great moment when Christ looked up and the Father's loving face was not there because Christ was facing instead, if I may put it this way, and I want to put it this way to, to bring out the strength of it, Christ was facing the epicenter of the earthquake of the judgment of Almighty God for you and I. And the Lord was doing it. Here it is, beloved. He was doing it alone. It's as if Christ is saying to us, I'm going to stand in the face of the full fury of what you deserve. You are not going to feel a bit of it because I'm not simply going to take it as, it, as if it were with you. I'm going to absorb it for you. So as Jesus cries out that cry, Jesus is pointing us to that sense of isolation which he experienced. Jesus is not only doing that, but he is pointing in your outline, this is point number two, notice this, God's refusal to answer. If you look at the first psalm, or, or first verse of Psalm 22, that is a distress cry of the psalmist. Okay? The psalmist is crying out in distress because he doesn't feel that God is answering him. Have you ever been there? Have you ever prayed a prayer or, or prayed many times and you just don't feel like God is answering that prayer and you get distressful, don't you? That's what the psalmist was feeling. He didn't think that God was answering him. He didn't feel God's voice. And so he cried out in Psalm 22 and verse 1. He cried out in that distress, in his need, in his distress. And here Jesus is highlighting that, that on the cross, there is no voice. Now, students of the body, you know, of the Bible, you know that many times throughout the scriptures, from the old to what we call the new, when, when God's people calls out, he answers. You know that, and I know that. Two examples I want to give you is this. When Abraham, you remember when Abraham went up to Mount Moriah? And he got to the top, 
and he was going to put Isaac on the altar to sacrifice him, what happened? A voice from heaven says, and I'm going to go back to old King James, touch not the lad. And Abraham didn't, of course. And then when, when the death angel gets close to, uh, to Jerusalem in the days when David wickedly, you remember he took that census and he wasn't supposed to? And, and, and there is a voice that says, stop. What does David do? He stops. Throughout, God, throughout Scripture, God answers the cry of His people. But beloved, listen, here in Matthew 27, 27 here on Calvary, there's no answer. There's no voice. There's no answer to Jesus' cry. And Jesus is drawing our attention to that because he wants us to understand this. That God, even though God had often come to the rescue of his people before, and praise God for you and I that God comes certainly to our rescue in our time of need. Amen? Jesus is highlighting that it is the heart of the plan of God not to rescue him, not to answer him, in order that God will rescue you and I. Jesus is highlighting that the Father does not answer Jesus because Jesus cries, Lord, Lord so that we as believers will never hear the words, Depart from me, I never knew you. Beloved, Jesus stands in our place, and so this cry points to Jesus' profound sense of isolation, of abandonment by his Father. Now, as we think of that, it's, it's hard for us, one, to comprehend it. And it's hard for us in our human frailty to think of what to say about it. It's deep. But I do want to quote to you what one of the greats I'd, lo I'd love to read about and, and, and to read his life story, J.C. Ryle, says about this. J.C. Ryle says this, and I quote, There is a deep mystery in these words which no mortal man can fathom. There might be, there, they were meant to express the real pressure of Jesus' soul on the enormous burden of world sin. They were meant to show how truly and literally He was our substitute. He was made sin. He was made a curse for us. He endured God's righteous anger, anger against a world's sin in his own person. End of quote. Now, why does Matthew show us this? Why, why is he doing this? Because he wants us to understand, beloved, what, what Jesus Christ was doing. That it wasn't an accident. It wasn't a mistake. It didn't catch him by surprise our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, listen, He chose this in our place. And He chose this in our place because it's a measure of His great love for you and I. The third thing I want us to see is this. It's a measure of the sinfulness of sin. Let me say this as passionately as I can. If this is what it took to forgive sin, all right? We read last week in the scriptures of Matthew 27. We know the scourging before. Now we're seeing the crucifixion of, of Christ. If this, is the, if this is what it took to forgive sin, your sin, my sin, how wicked must sin be? If this is what it took for forgiveness. 
And I don't believe once we see how wicked sin is and what it took for your sin and my sin to be forgiven, I don't see how we can ever look flippantly on sin again. And I don't think once we see this and we come to grips with it, I don't think we can ever act as if it's no big deal to sin against God. And I believe that we cannot as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, I do not believe that we can look at sin that way ever again, that it's just something, oh well, I goofed. Beloved, it took a lot to forgive you, to forgive me of our sins. Please don't miss this. Our sin cost our Savior. And what did it cost him? It cost him, and everything was thrown on him, if I may use this phrase, the volcano of the wrath of God. Now, you've seen pictures of active volcanoes. You've seen them on the news. You've seen them on different channels where they talk about vol volcanoes erupting. And you see the force and the devastation. That, beloved, is what Jesus took for you, for me, and to forgive our sins. We are seeing here a picture of what sin deserves and how ugly sin is to Almighty God. And Matthew reminds us, and he uses this to remind us of the greatness of the sinfulness of sin. Also, Matthew wants us to see something else. He wants us to see the greatness of Christ's love. Look at Matthew 46. As Matthew reminds us of that cry which, of course, Jesus lifts up, which comes from Psalm 22. Matthew is reminding us of, and this is number four on your outline, the Father's involvement in the Lord's endurance of sin on Calvary for us. And if we fail to see how the Father was moved in what was happening on, the, on Calvary, and not only on what was happening on Calvary, but what he was causing to happen on Calvary, what the father saw when he looked at the cross, when he looked at the cross, he saw his own son. He saw his, the son of his love. And now here's the son on the cross and the son is enduring the wrath which he did not deserve in your place and mine. And when Jesus the Christ says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God says nothing. Because of his love, and I want to keep stressing this, beloved, because of his love for you and I. Because of his love for you and I, God will not answer his son. Because as you know, his son has taken our place. His son has borne our penalty. His son is under the curse, listen, where we should have been. But through his grace, through God's mercy, we're not. Because of what his son did. So there's no answer for the son. And that is, that, that is the meaning of of the Father's love to redeem you and I. The second part of our outline is this. I want you to see the ungratefulness of those who were witness. Think of this. To the, they were witnesses and the ungratefulness of these people who were the witnesses of God's work of redemption. They were there. Matthew turns us to verse 47 and 48 to show us the misunderstanding and the ungratefulness of those who were standing inches from this central act in God's work of redemption. These people had the work of Christ in their face, so to speak. 
Yet Matthew shows us three responses. In verse 47, number one, there is misunderstanding, isn't there? They hear Jesus quoting, like I said before, quoting from Matthew 22, or Psalm 22, verse 1. And what do they think? He's crying for Elijah. Have you ever thought, why Elijah? Here's why. The Jewish people in biblical times believed that since, since Elijah was taken up to heaven before dying, that many times when a righteous man is persecuted and was fading, facing, facing death or persecution himself, that that righteous man might cry out to Elijah, and sometimes and oftentimes, Elijah would come and rescue that man from persecution. So that was their thinking. Now, where they got that, beloved, I don't know. It was probably one of their traditions. One of the rabbis of old, their sages of old, came up with it. And that's what was passed down to them. But we know that the people were misunderstanding Jesus. Number two, we see an example of pity. And that's in verse 48. Now, it said a person. If you study the other Gospels, Mark, Luke, and John, you see that it was a soldier. And he goes and he soaks a sponge with old sour wine and he puts it on a reed and he gives it to Jesus as a drink. Now, our Lord and our Savior was Jewish. Amen? The occupying force were Romans. They were considered pagans, heathens, no account, dogs, whatever else you want to describe them. And the only person right there on the scene at the crucifixion that shows any kind of pity, I'm going to explain something about that in just a moment, but that shows any kind of pity or response to Jesus when he cried that out was this pagan Roman soldier. And I believe with all my heart that he thought he was doing something good to help this man. But here's the thing. Pity is, is so far short of what is demanded by the sacrifice of Christ, isn't it? One of my other favorite persons that I love to read his books and his sayings and, and his, and his uh, outlook on Scripture is Martin, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he says it right so many years ago in a, in a wonderful little book that he wrote, and the book was entitled The Cross. And Joan says this, and, 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 and I want to quote him. He says, when we look at the cross, God is not asking to pity Jesus because Jesus isn't the one who needs the pity. Sinners who continue under the judgment of God, they are the ones who need pity, end of quote. And beloved, when I read that, it was just like, even though this Roman soldier, I believe he did it out of pity, he felt sorry for him, Jesus isn't the one that needs pity. It's the unbeliever. The third response is found in verse 49, and it's a response of ridicule. There in verse 49, we, we see that there were some of those members of the mob who were saying, and if I may put it this way, well, let's just wait around and see if Elijah does show up and rescue. 
even though they say that and they believe it because they've heard it all their lives and they've had that teaching dwelled within them, they are still mocking our Lord and our Savior and they are right there before the cross and they didn't understand. They didn't get it, did they? Those are the three responses. Now, let me close by saying this. And I say about they, they did not understand or they, they misunderstood. Beloved, it takes a work of God's grace to understand the works and the words of the cross. It takes the Spirit working in our hearts to understand the words and the work of of the cross. You cannot understand it in yourself. The most educated person cannot understand it in themselves and all their education. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit of God to penetrate and to bore into our hearts to get us to understand what went on on Calvary's cross. And until that time, as the scripture says, it is foolishness to those who do not believe. And they look at us as foolish. But praise God that God did a work in our heart by His Spirit. And if I may say it this way, the light came on and we understood the work of the cross. Well, in definitely closing this morning, To anyone who is listening this, to this message, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray, and it is my prayer, and I have been praying, that God's Holy Spirit will do a work in your heart and you will see what truly went on on Calvary's cross and that you will embrace the crucified one who will come and reign forever and ever and ever. Amen. That's my heart cry, that you will understand it. And you will not understand it in all your education, in all your sophistication. You can only understand it when the Holy Spirit of God again works in your heart and opens your eyes to see the works and the words of the cross of Calvary. And that is my prayer to you this morning. Let's pray. Our Lord God, as much as we try, as much as we desire, as much as, I'll just be personal, as much as I hope I can do somewhat of justice to this, your word, I know I can't. And yet, Father, I pray to you, I cry out to you that, that your word speaks to our hearts. And for the unsaved, that they will that they will have the Holy Spirit of God open their spiritual eyes to the understanding of your words and what went on on the cross of Calvary. And they will cry out to you and beg you to forgive them of their sins and that they would embrace it as true and that they would embrace him who is the truth to the saving of their very souls, Father, and for His glory for all eternity. Father, we praise You. We love You. I ask that You, that as, as elementary, as, as, as basic as this message is, that, oh, dear God, use Your Word to penetrate hearts that they would see their need for the crucified one.
and that they would embrace you as their Lord and their Savior. We ask this in the holy and beautiful, magnificent name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen.